October 4th, 1957. The Soviet Union, or as we know now as Russia, launches Sputnik 1, the world's first artificial satellite. What began as a technological breakthrough escalated into a fight between the most powerful nations of the world, the United States and the Soviet Union. They wanted scientific and technological superiority. The launch of Sputnik 1 triggered the space race and ultimately war. The political tension and ideological conflict between the US and the Soviet Union were already at their peaks, but supremacy in science, technology and military power was seen as the only way for each country to demonstrate its superiority. Hey Space Cats, I'm Dr Maggie Liu. Each year, October 4th marks the beginning of World Space Week, a celebration of space science and space exploration. But behind these inspiring intentions lies a dark story of war. So, story time. It began three years earlier in the heart of the Soviet Union. Sergei Korolev, a name whispered with both fear and admiration, stood before the Minister of Defence. His plan? An artificial satellite, or Sputnik as they call it in Russian. The Soviets were not alone in their ambition. Across the ocean, in the White House, President Eisenhower declared to the world that the United States would send a satellite into space. But before his promise could materialise, it was already too late. In a moment of triumph, the Soviet scientists celebrated a groundbreaking milestone in human history. Humanity's venture beyond the confines of Earth's boundaries for the very first time. Sputnik 1's ascent into orbit left a long, ominous shadow cast across the globe, in more than just the literal sense. To some, this launch symbolised more than just exploration. It was a declaration of war. Today a new moon is in the sky, a 23-inch metal sphere placed in orbit by a Russian rocket. Here an artist's conception of how the feat was accomplished. A three-stage rocket. Number one, the booster in the class of an intercontinental missile. Its weight estimated at 50 tons. The smaller second stage took over at 5,000 miles an hour and carried on to the highest point reached. 500 miles up, the artificial moon is boosted to a speed counterbalancing the pull of gravity and released. You are hearing the actual signals transmitted by the Earth-circling satellite, one of the great scientific feats of the age. In the heart of America, the news of Sputnik's launch spread fast, sending shockwaves through the nation's core. Newspapers screamed with headlines like, the Soviets are taking space. Politicians huddled in emergency meetings and scientists were torn between awe and apprehension. President Eisenhower was of course gravely concerned. Surrounded by his military advisors, they contemplated how this could happen. How was it possible? Sputnik 1 weighed in at 83 kilograms. That was significantly heavier than anything the Americans were even working on. And soon their faces of disbelief turned into anger as they realised they had underestimated the enemy. If the Soviets could send Sputnik into orbit, they could easily send something else, something more threatening. The Soviets must have rockets far more powerful than they had anticipated, powerful enough to launch heavy nuclear warheads to the US. This fear became known as the missile gap. And this is where the space race begins, coming hand in hand with the arms race, pushing the boundaries of science and technology whilst also fueling the flames of the Cold War. President Dwight Eisenhower tried to downplay the importance of the Sputnik launch, but poured countless funding and resources into the space program so that they could catch up. He was set on getting America into space. But shortly after the launch of Sputnik 1, the Soviets launched yet another spacecraft, this time carrying the first ever animal to space, a dog named Laika. 
по коллективы научно-исследовательских институтов, конструкторских бюро, заводов и исполнительных организаций, создавшие новую ракету, посвящает этот УСК 21-му съезду Коммунистической партии Советского Союза. Sputnik 2 was several times heavier than Sputnik 1. It was 500 kilograms, six times heavier than Sputnik 1. And by the time the US government got to launching their first ever spacecraft, Vanguard, months after Sputnik 1, and despite weighing at just one kilograms in weight, the rocket just couldn't hack it. It was a huge setback to the US. The panic filtered down into homes and schools and workplaces. For many Americans, Sputnik was more than just a satellite. It was circling the Earth every 90 minutes. It was a silent sentinel orbiting above their heads, a reminder that the Soviet Union was watching, perhaps even capable of striking them from above. This was a national security risk. Nikita Khrushchev, the Soviet premier who succeeded Joseph Stalin, boasted about Soviet technological superiority and their growing stockpiles of ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. The fear of a missile gap developing between the US and the Soviet Union was exploited by US lawmakers and political campaigners, so they fast-tracked their own ICBMs. The Titan I and later the Titan II were part of the US's response to this perceived missile gap. These powerful ICBMs were equipped with nuclear warheads, capable of inflicting devastating damage to a target on the opposite side of the world, and demonstrating that the United States could retaliate effectively in the event of a nuclear attack. The Titan I missile developed in the late 1950s was the first of the Titan series. It was a two-stage missile fueled by liquid propellant and utilized an advanced guidance system to ensure accurate delivery of its payload. The Titan I had a range of about 6,300 miles, enabling it to reach targets across the Soviet Union from launch sites in the US. The Titan II missile, an improved version of Titan I, entered service in the early 1960s. It featured an even more powerful engine, a more sophisticated guidance system, an enhanced payload capacity. The Titan II had a range of over 9,000 miles, making it capable of striking targets anywhere in the Soviet Union. But more importantly, they were stored in underground silos, making it more survivable in a first strike and therefore contributing to the US's second strike capability. So they could retaliate even after being attacked. This was crucial in the Cold War logic of deterrence. Last year, during my trip to Tucson, Arizona, I was fortunate enough to spend some time in the Titan Missile Museum, where a preserved Titan II missile still stands. This site is all that remains of the 54 Titan II missile sites that were on alert across the United States between 1963 and 1987. In the underground silo facility that I visited, we reenacted a Titan II activation. The missile could be launched within 58 seconds, delivering a several megaton thermonuclear warhead to its target in less than 30 minutes. This destructive power would ensure that a single missile could take out an entire city. And like I said, 54 of these were dotted all around the US. 
No one at the facility knew when they would launch or where the missile would hit. They stood on alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week for two decades, waiting for the call that would give them the input numbers to start the countdown. Some believe that the deployment of the Titan I and II missiles played a significant role in deterring the Soviet Union from launching a nuclear attack against the United States, but others would say differently. In any case, I think we got a pretty good deal out of it when the Titan program was later decommissioned. Because they gifted those rockets to NASA. These missiles were then used to launch a variety of satellites to space, including the Voyager missions to Jupiter and Saturn. The Titan missiles also played a role in the development of the Space Shuttle. So there you have it. The launch of Sputnik marked a turning point in human history, not just for its technological significance, but also for the way it links space exploration to the pursuit of power. Even today, nations are pouring resources into developing ever more sophisticated satellites and other space-based technologies. Now, this isn't driven by scientific curiosity or national pride, but instead the militarization of space. Thank you to my YouTube Perks members for supporting this video. If you enjoyed it, please don't forget to leave me a like, share and subscribe.